It's good to have Dave and Connie with us, and Dave and Connie, I hope that you feel loved. You are. And there will be a lot of people who are praying for you, and uh, not just as you go, but while you're there. You know, may God remove all the anxieties in, in travel and living there and dealing with things, uh, and may God provide the funding for maybe a hundred houses. And uh, we will go with you in our prayer. We've been looking in uh, the book of John for the last few weeks, and um, we're going back there again to John chapter 4. And Israel has had a long and rich heritage and history, but not always days that were fantastic. And as a matter of fact, as you look through the Old Testament, maybe the best way to describe it is like this. They would follow God, and God would bless them, and things would go good, and they would prosper as a nation, and then they would forget about God and bottom out again, and then wake up, oh yeah, God, and they would, right? And so God would send people to constantly calling them back. So their, their lives were more like roller coasters as they followed God, yet God's heart was on them. And this long, rich history. And uh, last week, I think it was last week, I, I talked a little bit about Babylon taking over Judah and, and had brought them into exile and didn't destroy their cities and kill all the people, but destroyed their cities and moved them in to where they lived to intermix and kind of hopefully disseminate through and, and lose the Jewish tradition and all that kind of stuff. I want to talk about the other side of that today a little bit. Uh, let me rewind back and, um, and give you a little bit of this story. In the 1970s, as a teenager, I remember learning uh, what's called the walk through the Old Testament. Has anybody ever done that? Does that ring a bell? Oh, there's a couple of you. Good. And what it is, it's, uh, it's a seminar you can go to, and they walk through all the stories in the Old Testament. And giving everything keywords and hand signals, you memorize bits of it all the way through and gives you a, a crazy summary of the, the chronology of the Old Testament and the story of God's unfolding redemption through their history. And over the last bunch of years, I got a chance to teach that and travel around and do some of that. But my favorite was to do it at kids camp or in my grade five, six Sunday school class that I taught. And we would take all year in that Sunday school class and go through all of these stories of the Old Testament while we taught them the hand signals and the things. And at the end of the year, we had all kinds of prizes. If they tracked with us, I promised them that if you track with us all year, you'll know more about the Old Testament than any of your parents, including the pastor's kid. But what we would do at the end of the year is we'd have a big party, we'd get together, and everybody would try to do it, and the people that did it mistake-free the fastest got these great prizes. I want to give you a little bit of it today. I'm not going to do the whole thing, because I want to stop where Babylon takes over Judah and pick up there, because it shows us how historically they got from here to there, right? And this is what it looks like. If you know it, then do it with me. You'll see if I get it right. Creation, fall, flood, nations, 4,000 years, Ur, Persian Gulf, salt, Sarah, Abraham, Lot, Terah, Tigris, Euphrates, Haran, Teradiz, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Mediterranean, Israel, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob, Joseph, Egypt, Jews, Egypt, 400 years, bondage, Moses, let my people go. No, 10 plagues, Red Sea, Mount Sinai, law, tabernacle, Levites and priests, offerings and feasts, counting the faces, Kadesh Oasis, 12 spies, wanders, dies. Moab, Moses, three sermons dies. Joshua, Jordan, Jericho, divide, conquer, south, north, uh, divide, settle, 12 tribes. Right? Now is where it changes a little bit because we have the period, the judges. And we have uh, Gideon and Deborah and Samson. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes except for Ruth and Samuel. United Kingdom. Saul, no heart. David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. 40, 40, 40, 120 years. Divided kingdom. North, south. Israel, Judah, 1920, 08. Assyria, Israel, scatter. Babylon, Judah, 
exile. I'm going to stop there. There's lots more to it. But I do that to, to bring us to this place because I, I said that in the divided kingdom, there was north and south. Israel went north, and that was 10 of the tribes. Judah and Benjamin, called Judah then, went south. And they split in 722 BC because some of them didn't want Solomon's son to be king. So these 10 packed up and moved north. These two embraced Solomon's son as their king and stayed there. Have you ever been part of a church split? Many of you have, as I've had these lots of conversations. And you know what? Here is a nation split. And for 700 years leading up to the time of Christ, they split. That was 722 BC when Assyria took Israel and scattered. They didn't destroy their cities. They took some of the people and scattered them all over the place and moved other people back into the cities. So some of the people lived right where they've always lived, but my next door neighbors were new and they were foreigners and all this and this was horrible to the Jewish nation. And the dream of the Assyrians was by infiltration and intermixing, we could get rid of this Jewish culture and the Jewish religion and all that kind of stuff, just, right? In, and they're staying in their own homes. So in 605 BC, Babylon took over Judah and exiled them and took them, we talked about that last time, with the same intent. Let's not make them slaves or anything. We'll just intermix and get them in our culture and it'll just kind of disappear. So the 10 tribes that went north, Israel, and I said 1920, That is the number of kings. In Israel in the north, there was 19 kings. In Judah in the south, there was 20 kings. In, in the north, there were zero good kings. In the south, they had eight good kings. So still, out of all of those kings, only eight of them were good. And they had a time period where they really, really rough time period with God after they had split. So this feud was going on for hundreds of years. This people in the north, Israel, that got scattered became what's referred to now as the ten lost tribes of Israel. Those that stayed there in their homes, in their cities, and intermixed with all the other people soon became intermarrying, and, all the, and, and, and that is the travesty that caused this feud. Because these Jews from these ten tribes married Gentiles, that was the unforgivable crime. That's what pushed them apart, and to the Jews, to the pure Jews, they were no longer Jews, and they got the name Samaritans. So here we have in this story that Dave read for us, I'm not going to go back into the story in detail, and and he's read it so we have the context. But, But we arrive here with several hundred years of this feud brewing and getting worse and worse, the pure Jews putting up huge barriers like the Berlin Wall to protect themselves from these impure people. They would say that they are the worst and most ungodly people of all. And yet these were Jews who worshipped the same God. The Jews built their temple in Jerusalem and refused to let the Samaritans worship there, but told them, you can't worship anywhere else. You have a temple there, it's not, you can't worship there. And so they put up these huge barricades in front of the Samaritans' worship. They couldn't worship. They couldn't be part of what they were doing. And the Samaritans still regarded themselves as Jews, waiting for the Messiah to come and straighten it out. To a Jew, you can't walk through the Samaritan territory. You couldn't eat with or talk to a Samaritan. And worst of all, you cannot eat the food that the Samaritans make. Palestine is about 120 miles long. In the south part today is Judah. To the north part is Galilee, and in the middle is Samaria. The Jews couldn't walk through, so if someone from Judah was going to Galilee, they would walk around. And if you walk straight through, it'd be about a three-day journey. If you had to walk around, it'd be six or seven days. What's happening here? Jesus and his disciples doesn't say a whole lot about it. It just says they were going through Samaria. You didn't do that. 
Okay, now look back. We, we went to John chapter 2 when, when Jesus was at the wedding. You can't do that, right? He took those purification jugs, the set aside for the religious rituals, and he, he filled those with wine. You don't do that. In, in John chapter 3, as he sat with Nicodemus, and he's saying, what you've done on your whole life, and you've pleased the church, and you've done everything you've been taught, you're off. The same message going on here. Here, they're going right through Jerusalem or through Samaria. You don't do that. He continues to make the religious churchgoers angry. So they come to Sychar. There's a fork in the road, and at that fork outside that town, there's a well. It's Jacob's well. Jacob. Rich Jewish history right here. This is the land that Jacob had that he gave to his son Joseph. And Joseph, who was sold to Egypt, right, and died there, they came, they brought his bones back, and they're buried here. This is rich historical part of the country for the Jews, and they couldn't go there. They wouldn't go there because of this hatred that had festered. The well there is about 100 feet deep. If you Google it, you can see pictures of it. It's inside a building now because there's a shrine set up to it. But it's not a pure well. It's a seeping well. I don't know what the real word for that is. But what it is, is it's the long hole that they dug, and the water that's in the ground seeps into the hole. And that's what they would gather up and drink. When Jesus in this passage talks about living water, the words he used would have been clearly understood to her as fresh flowing water, which is very different than what she was drinking. So when Jesus says, I can give you a permanent supply of flowing stream water. Give me that. I'll never have to come. Into, it makes perfect sense. But we know also he's talking about a water and a thirst spiritually that cannot run dry. In this passage, I see three things. Three things here that are part of Jesus' character. Uh, and, and they're things that Jesus, we can say, and really what this series is turning into is what did Jesus come to earth for? I started a couple of weeks ago saying we want to walk through here and look at how Jesus made disciples. And what does he do in building disciples? So far, there's been three chapters, and all he's doing is throwing a sledgehammer at their religious tradition and customs. It doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with building disciples, but it does. And as I've prepared these week in and week out, I'm going and looking for the disciples bit. And I'm coming out saying, God, what do you have to say to our church? Because Jesus is doing something really interesting. John isn't necessarily written chronologically. Why is the first three things we see from Jesus this? Here's what I see. First, I see that um, Jesus is demonstrating that we need to love people. He's demonstrating, secondly, that we need to love God and God alone and worship Him alone. And third, that we need to remove barriers that we have set up to protect what we think is sacred. Let's look at the first one. Love God, or sorry, love people, period. Both Jesus and this woman knew the rules. They know, knew the expectation. They knew the situation. And when she saw him, him there, she normally, in any situation, would have hid her face, bowed away, and even ran. If he spoke to her, the correct response would have been shame or hostility. But none of that happened. Jesus was far more concerned with her heart, with her life, with her soul, than he was about the expected behavior. And none of the expected things happened. It was just simply an authentic and genuine conversation. No judgments, just love. When we look at that New Testament principle that Jesus is demonstrating here, that the other writers touch on lots and keep coming back to, and Jesus later said, don't judge, just love. God is the judge. Let him do that. You know what? If I could put this into simple language, here's how I would say this. 
that Jesus is actually coming to us and saying, I will lift off your shoulders the burden of judging others. Don't even go there. I'll lift that burden, that weight of judgment off you so you can be free to just love people. Easy to say, really hard to do. My kids are in their new school and they're making new friends. And as a dad, what am I telling them? I want you to make good friends, people who are gonna help you make good choices and live well and, and pour into you and help you thrive. Who are the first people they make friends with? You know exactly where I'm going with this, right? I had to sit down all day Thursday and just battle with this in my heart because this is what Jesus is saying. And I'm saying to my kid, no, 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 we don't want to be friends with them. I just go, wait a second. To be free from the burden of judging, of judging and just love. And you know what? Maybe my house needs to be full of people people all the time that's a risk you've seen the movie or the play Les Mis I'm sure lots of us have seen that I've only seen the movie once and I'm not really familiar with the whole thing as many as you are but I remember clearly there's one scene where he is staying with the priest and in the night he gets up and steals all the silverware and then escapes and uh, not long later, Inspector Clouseau comes and brings him back and uh, says, did this man steal the silverware? And he says, oh, son, I, I gave him the silverware. And son, you forgot the candlesticks. And you see what he's doing? Not judging. Yes, he stole them. But he's taking the pressure off of that guy, taking the judgment off and just free to love, which in fact turns that man's life around. In Calgary, in the church I was at, we were very close to a, a First Nations reserve, and they were often passing by the church and stopping in, and we built relationships with a n number of them. Well, one day, before youth group on a Wednesday night, I was in there getting stuff ready, and one of the high school kids comes running in and goes, Dave, there's a dead guy in the parking lot. I walked outside, and I look, and there's a man from First Nations. He's laying on his stomach in the parking lot with his face right in the pavement, nose squished in right in the pavement, but his knees are bent and his legs, his feet are straight up in the air. And I look and he's not dead. I shake him a little bit and he just, hi, Pastor Dave. It was Norbert. And I've known Norbert lots. He's come and slept in the chair in my office lots of times and everything. And you know what? We had a really difficult time because they would, they would come to our church and they would be drunk and they would cause trouble and they would steal things and yet just to love them. How? We had a food bank in that church that we collected to give to the, the, the reserve right there that was very poor. And we had this big bin right inside our front doors that people would constantly drop food in and all the time I'd walk out there and it's empty. And they had come and stolen it. And I don't understand, it's for you. Maybe we should just change the rules and it's, if there's something there, just come and get it. But what they would do is they built a fort, it's like here where there was trees behind the building, they built a fort in there. And they stole chairs from the church and put it in the fort. And they stole shelves from the church and put it in the fort. And then they'd steal the food from their food bank and put it on the shelves in the fort. And we'd go out there and sit down and t chat with them. And it was, it was hysterical. How do we, how are we free to not judge and just love? That is what Jesus is demonstrating here. I read a story as I was talking with my kids this week. I read, I'd read a story a long time ago, and I remembered I was sitting down telling Jackson this story. No idea if it's real or not, but it makes a point. It's, it's, I read it years ago. It's two little kids in kindergarten. And in the kindergarten class, the desk is pushed together in pairs, and in the very, very front row, a little boy and a little girl were, were desk mates. And the boy had an accident. And uh, the girl sitting beside him knew full well, right? So what do you do? In most cases, ooh, you stand up out of your chair, you back off, point your finger, and everyone in the class knows that this poor kid has wet his pants, am I right? That's the normal response. 
What this girl did was not make a scene. As the boy was whispering to the teacher what had happened, she got up and walked over to the other side of the classroom, picked up the goldfish bowl, brought it over to the desk, and put it down on the desk that was tilted. As soon as she put it down, it fell over and soaked her and him. And I thought, what a great example. Don't judge. Just love. And that's what Jesus is telling us the first thing here. The second thing is to love God. To stick to truth and worship him alone. I think we do get bent out of shape on this a lot and we get our, our blinders on and we put up barricades and I wonder sometimes we end up worshiping ourselves more than we worship God. Dan McCauley, when he was here a couple of weeks ago singing, I don't know if you were all here, one of the things he said, he told, said a story about this kind of thing and he said to the lady, uh, I'm sorry, we forgot to tell you we're not worshiping you today. You know what? We all have things that we hold sacred. We have our sweet spots. We have the style of worship that makes me connect with God more than any other, and I like that. We like it when, when the preacher wears a tie. And several people already have said that my shirt's inside out. <laughs> we, we, we like that. We, we have these things that are sacred to us of varying degrees, and it's just it's the reality. Some of them are incredibly valuable. Some of them are just there. But the same as turning the water into wine, the same as the conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus again makes the same statement. The Samaritans were forced to worship on their own and not in the place they were only allowed to worship. And Jesus says, it's not about that. It's not about the place. He says, the day is coming when all of this will change and you won't worship in a place. You'll worship in spirit and truth. And he's looking for people who will worship in spirit and in truth. The Samaritans were stuck. They were trapped by what the Jews held sacred. The trappings, the rules, the expectations, the traditions. Got any? David David demonstrates four hearts of worship. The first one that David demonstrates is a responsive type worship. And in this, God is the only stimulus. And I think in our Western world of churches, we've got into sort of a groove that when the music starts, then we start getting into worship groove. It's the music is a stimulus for us for worship. And folks, no matter how we look at that, that's wrong. God is the only stimulus. The second kind of worship we see in David's life is a pleasing worship. This is where God is the audience. Where we gather together, we and sing, and we may as well all be up here because we are singing to an audience of one. And this is where I get into trouble because, because some days I really like it. And some days I don't. And I have to shake myself and say, folks, then I'm not the audience. And you are not the audience. God is the audience. That's a pleasing worship. It's not about whether I like it at all. Is God pleased? The third kind of worship that I see in David's heart is a sacrificial worship. And this is where God is valued and maybe my values are hurt a little bit. Maybe my wants and my desires are sacrificed to bring worship to God. God's, God is valued. The fourth is a participating in worship where it is us together serving God. Not serving each other, serving God. We all come with sacred things. Things that are good and helpful, but they're sacred to us. Things that block us, and they're sacred to us. The things that block others, and they're sacred to us. These could be things like place, they could be things like clothes. could be the drums. Dave Hamill told me he was going to wear sweatpants today to do the announcements, and I said, good, do it, because that'll fit in my sermon. He chickened out. Did you see that? <laughs> this week already, in the last couple of weeks, I've talked to many of you, and I'm starting to hear little bits of your story. 
and I, I talked with Gary Crozen, and I know I only got the surface of all the things he has to say. Is he here right now? But you know what, Gary, the radical life change when God grabbed hold of him. I talked to Jean-Marie and got some of his story this week. And the radical change when God got a hold of his life. And let me ask, when God got a hold of you like that, did any of that other stuff matter? No. Why? Because Jesus and Jesus only. Jesus is looking for people who will worship in spirit and in truth. There is a church in New Jersey that I've kind of been following. They meet in an open pub. And half of the Christians across the United States are livid that they would even do this. It's appalling. And the other half are following with support and prayer. And God is doing great things. Third thing, that brings us actually right to number three, is can we actually remove barriers? Barriers that we have set up and things to protect things that we think is sacred. The 800 or 600 year old feud with the Samaritans. Jesus was not to talk to the Samaritans, let alone walk through their land. If you were a Jew and you intermarried with outside race, you, your family would have a funeral for you. It was the unforgivable crime. These people were no longer Jews. And they were angry and hostile. And yet what do we see? Jesus is not only walking through Samaria. Where did his disciples go? Verse 8. Disciples went into town to buy food. You can't do that. They are already learning that it doesn't matter. In all of eternity, these things don't matter. God only. The disciples were already getting it. Jesus very intentionally was breaking down barriers. It was a woman. And the rabbis were known to say things like, better the words of the law be burned than taught to a woman. This is the beginning of the gospel being universal. This is the beginning of people being treated equal with equality. The rabbi was not allowed to talk to any women in public. Jesus did it over and over and over and over. There were Pharisees that were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. You know why? Because every time they saw a woman on the street, they would cover their eyes and they would often walk into walls and fall off the curb. They were so adamant. Jesus infuriated the religious proper church-going people. Very intentionally breaking down barriers. Third thing was this was not just a woman, it was a woman of reputation. And no man, no decent man would risk his reputation by being seen talking to her in public. Jesus intentionally breaking down barriers. Well, folks, what are our barriers? Have we got things that are sacred or things that we've set up to protect what we think is sacred? Are we excluding people or blocking people or making it difficult for them to fit in? In my years as a pastor, we've dealt with dancing in the church. We've dealt with having women on the elders board. At Ambrose in the university I was teaching at, we criticized like crazy because we opened a conversation with the Catholic Church. All things that people have set up as barriers. Can we remove the barriers? The Berlin Wall. You folks, most of you have lived through that whole experience. You understand that. The Berlin Wall was there to keep people out, not keep people in. And when it came down, we understand what it means to break down the barriers. And can we do that, even if there's risk involved? If it's not a core issue, can we open our hand? So God is worshipped, God only. And we can love without judging. This is exactly what Jesus is doing three chapters in a row. The feud, the people are saying, we will never surrender, we will never back away from my position. You know what, we could argue about all kinds of things. We could argue about whether we should speak in tongues or not speak in tongues, or whether we should worship on a Saturday or on a Sunday. 
you know what, maybe we should just relish our differences. Agree to disagree, focus only on the Father. I was part of a conference in the year 2000 where the conference for a large denomination in Canada was making the decision to remove the word premillennial from their statement of faith. Half of the room was livid. They were crazy angry because we can't remove that. That's a doctrinal truth. The other half of the room is saying, it doesn't matter. Jesus will come back. Does it matter if it's before or after? And, and the thing was, it was viewed as this was an exclusive term, that we believe this, rather than saying, what is central, what is core, let's focus on that, and I can sit beside someone who believes a little bit different than me, but we're, we've got the core. We're worshiping the Father together. Does that make sense? Folks, in this room and in our first service, we have people from a Pentecostal background. We have people from a united background. Why are you sitting together? That's sarcasm. <laughs> we have Catholics. We have Alliance. We have Lutheran. We have Anglicans. We even have Irish. <laughs> this is us. This is us. There will be differences. Let's break down the barriers. Let's live in unity. God has made us Sobel Christian Fellowship. Let's live and move forward in unity, in loving people without judging, in worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and breaking down the barriers that separate. And we know that the Son of God has come and have, has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Go in peace.